you are listening to Catholic Family Podcast. Greetings, fellow travelers through the liturgical year. This is Lisa Davis with another Feast Day Quick Take about a very special friend of mine, and I hope a friend of yours, too. The worldly world provides an almost unending supply of possible mentors, from athletes to actors to cartoon characters, and whether we realize it or not, they fly or dance or sing or diddy bop into our consciences and take up residence there. Speaking from the position of a former little girl, I can tell you that Tweety Bird and Cinderella definitely occupied significant space in my preteen psyche. And I cannot lie, they still have a corner there. Tweety may deserve some blame for the tendency to sarcasm I have to work against. But from Tweety, I learned to not be fooled, to know my enemy. Cinderella was all about the love of pretty dresses, something I have to curtail, but she also taught me the fortitude of singing in the midst of poverty and sorrow. Not much different, I guess, than the human influences of my life, who have also been blessings and lessons, though I certainly hope the influence of my mom and aunts and all the sisters I've known has a deeper effect than animated drawings. Needless to say, not all influences are as innocent as Tweety and Cinderella. Hollywood has flooded the market with a host of cartoons and movies in the last several decades that, worse than Tweety's quirkiness, glorify bad behavior and immorality. These characters are bad company, not just for our children, but for us as well. Our choice of friends is so important to the salvation of our souls. This just cannot be emphasized enough. Every friend we make will either help us make it to heaven or lead us away from it. It's as simple as that. And it's not just flesh and blood friends that have this power to affect us. We are all equally subject to the sway of friends we make through the power of stories, whether it's television, movies, videos, or books, whether they're fiction or nonfiction. We are so hardwired to learn this way that when he wished to teach, Jesus spoke in parables, and without parables he did not speak. You'll find that in Matthew chapter 13, verse 34. It matters a lot who tells a story, and what lessons the characters in a story teach, though. We have a responsibility before God to choose our friends wisely, and to teach our children to choose friends and stories wisely as well. Which leads us to today's saint. A good friend to many of us, and one that deserves to be introduced to everyone. Braver than Merida and brave, more true to course than Pocahontas, more stubborn in her quest for truth than Rapunzel, victorious over all forces of evil, including the Novus Ordo, and a real princess, girls, first on earth, and now in the glorious courts of heaven. To know her is to love her. I give you St. Philomena. The world learned the story of St. Philomena in a miraculous way, through the saint herself, as she related it to a holy nun, a Dominican tertiary named Sister Maria Luisa de Jesu, who had prayed repeatedly to know the mystery of the virgin saint who had been discovered in the St. Priscilla catacombs in Rome. When her tomb had been uncovered during a restoration on May 24, 1802, all that was known were the symbols of martyrdom, arrows, a lance, and an anchor, together with a symbol of virginity, a lily, and the words Lumena Pax de Cum Fi, written on three terracotta tiles, which makes no sense at all if you know your Latin. But if the tiles are turned around, we know that it means Pax tecum Philomena, or peace to you, Philomena. This was pretty quickly worked out, because the tiles had obviously been misplaced for some reason, due perhaps to a hasty burial or due to the darkness necessary during the times of persecution when she was buried. Or maybe the stonemason who set the stones was illiterate. We'll never know. But it was easily made clear that the small bones were those of a young girl. Sister Maria, along with many devout Catholics who had heard of this discovery, prayed that God would somehow reveal more of the story of the martyr. 
and God provided that it would be told, 31 years after the opening of the tomb. After many miracles had already occurred surrounding the mysterious martyr, and many prayers had been offered for her to solve the mystery, three different people from three different corners of Italy received the divine favor of hearing the story from St. Philomena herself. These three had never met, nor had the opportunity to communicate with one another, but each told identical details about St. Philomena's life and death. Here is the account written down in 1833 by Mother Maria Luisa de Jesu, the same year the other two accounts were recorded. After praying before a statue of the saint, following Holy Communion, Sister Maria asked specifically to know the date of her martyrdom. St. Philomena said to Sister in what she called a quiet and gracious voice, quote, Dear Sister, August 10th was the day of my rest, my triumph, my birth into heaven, my entering into the possession of such eternal goods as the human mind cannot possibly imagine. That is why my heavenly spouse disposed by his most high decrees that my coming to Manano should be on the day which had seen me coming to heaven. He prepared so many circumstances which should make my arrival at Munyano glorious and triumphant, giving joy to all the people, even though the priest who brought me had absolutely decided that my translation should take place on the fifth of the month, very quietly and in his own house. My omnipotent spouse impeded with him so many obstacles that the priest, although he did all he could to carry out his plan, could not do so. And so it came about that the said translation was made on the 10th, the day of my feast in heaven, end quote. Afterward, Sister Maria Luisa feared that she perhaps drifted off and dreamed this revelation, or that it was some kind of illusion, and she took the matter to her confessor, seeking his counsel. He did not dismiss it, but required Sister Luisa, in obedience, to ask St. Philomena to reveal more. After praying in her cell shortly afterward, the same quiet voice said, quote, I am the daughter of the king of a small Grecian state, and my mother too was of royal blood. As they had no children, my parents continually offered sacrifice and prayers to the false gods to obtain a child. We had in our family a doctor named Publius, and he was a Christian. He pitied the blindness of my parents, and especially he had compassion on my mother in her childlessness. Inspired by the Holy Spirit, he spoke to them of our faith, and also inspired, made them this promise. He said, If you want a child, be baptized and embrace the religion of Jesus Christ. Grace accompanied his words, and enlightened their minds, softened their hearts, and moved them to consent. They were instructed and were baptized with some of their courtiers who were in their confidence. A year later, on January 10th to be exact, I was born, and I was called Lumina because I had been conceived and born in the light of the faith, to which my parents were truly devoted. And then I was called Philomena, daughter of light, of that light of Christ which dwelt in my soul by the grace received in baptism. And because of my birth, many families in the kingdom became Christians. I grew up with the teaching of the gospel printed more and more deeply in my heart. When I was five, I received for the first time Jesus Christ in the Holy Eucharist, and in that day was planted in my heart the desire to be united forever to my Redeemer, who is the spouse of virgins. And when I was eleven, I consecrated myself to him by vow. There came the thirteenth year of my life. The peace of Christ, which until that day had reigned in the household and kingdom of my father, was disturbed by the proud and powerful emperor Diocletian, who unjustly declared a war against us. My father, realizing his inferior strength, decided to go to Rome and make some pact of peace with the emperor. So great was the tender affection my father had for me that he could not bear me out of his sight for an hour, and so I went with him on his journey to Rome, and rather than be left without us, my mother came too. Arrived in Rome, he asked an audience with the tyrant, and when it was granted, took me and my mother with him to the palace of the Caesars. While my father pleaded his case and pointed out the injustice of the war that was made on him, the emperor kept looking at me, and finally interrupted my father, saying, Do not distress yourself further. 
Your anxiety is at an end. Be consoled. You shall have all the imperial force for your own protection if you will but consent to a single condition, namely to give me your daughter Philomena for my wife. My parents accepted his condition, and on our return home sought to convince me of my great fortune in becoming the empress of the Romans. But I rejected the offer without a moment's hesitation, saying that I was already betrothed to Jesus Christ, as I had made a vow of virginity when I was eleven. My father tried to persuade me that as a child and a daughter I had no right to dispose of myself, and he used all his authority to make me accept the proposal. But my divine spouse gave me the strength to persevere in my resolution. Then my mother had recourse to caresses, begging me to have pity on my father, on my mother, and on my country. I replied, God is my father and heaven is my mother. My parents were unable to do anything in the face of my refusal, which would be taken by the emperor as a mere pretext of bad faith and the excuse of a deceiver. He ordered me to be brought into his presence. My father came for me, but seeing me unshaken in my resolution, he and my mother cast themselves at my feet and implored me to do as they wished, saying, Daughter, have pity on us, your parents. Have pity on the country and the kingdom. I replied, God and virginity come first. My kingdom and my country are heaven. In this tempest of trouble I was called before the emperor, and my father had to conduct me before him. Diocletian at first received me with every kindness and honor to make me accede to his request and to give him my promise, but he obtained nothing from me. Seeing me absolutely firm and losing all hope of gaining his desire, he began to threaten me. He could not overcome me. Then in a fit of fury, raging like a devil, he launched his threat. If you won't have me as a lover, you shall have me as a tyrant. I replied, I neither care for you as a lover nor fear you as a tyrant. The emperor, visibly infuriated, ordered me to be shut up in a dungeon under the armory of the imperial palace. I was chained hand and foot, fed once a day on bread and water, and he came himself daily to renew his pestering of me. But my heavenly spouse took care of me, and I never ceased to recommend myself to my Jesus and his most pure mother. On the thirty-sixth day there appeared to me the Most Holy Virgin, surrounded by the light of paradise, with her little son in her arms, and she spoke thus to me, Daughter, you will remain three more days in this dungeon, and then on the fortieth day of your imprisonment you will leave this place of sorrow. At these words I was filled with joy, but then there came from her mouth, When you leave it, you will be exposed to a great battle of atrocious torments. Thereupon I trembled, and saw myself in the anguish of death. But the heavenly queen gave me courage, saying thus, My daughter, you are dearer to me than any other, because you have my name and the name of my son. You are called Lumina, and my son is called Light, Sun, and Star, and I am called Dawn, Star, and Moon. I will be your helper. Now is the hour of human weakness which humbles you, but there will come the fortitude of grace which will assist you, and you shall have, besides the angel who guards you, the protection of the archangel Saint Gabriel, whose name signifies the strength of God. This archangel was my protector on earth, and I will send him to help you as my daughter, beloved among the daughters. This angel will assist you, and you shall come out victorious. These words revived my courage, and the vision disappeared, leaving much fragrance in the prison, which consoled me. At last Diocletian despaired of turning me from my decision, and so he had recourse to torture to intimidate me, and to make me retract the vow of faithful virginity made to my spouse. When the forty days were fulfilled, he had me brought out of prison and bound naked to a pillar in the presence of many of his gentlemen at arms and other officers of his palace and he had me scourged, saying, Since she obstinately refuses an emperor such as I am, for a malefactor condemned to death by his own countrymen, she deserves to be like him, to be treated to my justice. Then, seeing that though my body was covered with wounds and blood, and though life hardly remained in me, I was constant in my word, 
he ordered me to be taken back to prison to die. There I awaited forsaken till death should take me to repose in the presence of my spouse, when two angels appeared, anointed me with precious unguent, and healed me. The next morning the emperor was astounded on hearing the news. Seeing me in full beauty and health, he tried to make me believe that I owed this favor to Jove, who had cured me because he destined me to be the wife of the emperor, and filled with the devil, he gave me every honor, and with ardent caresses of impure affection strove to drive me to my ruin. But I remained firm, studying to convince myself that they were only the devices of the demon to take me from the most precious possession of my life, the lily of virginity which I had offered to my heavenly spouse. And he that strengthened me in this fight was the Holy Spirit. Not knowing how to answer the reasons I advanced in favor of our faith, and his gentleman being unable to assist him, he displayed the greatest scorn, and snarling like a lion, ordered that an anchor of iron should be fastened to my neck, and I should be thrown immediately into the Tiber, and that so I and my memory should perish. But Jesus, to show his omnipotence, for the confusion of the tyrant and of the idolaters, sent again two most beautiful angels, who broke the cord suddenly on my neck. The anchor fell into the depths of the Tiber, where it still lies covered with river mud. I was held up on the angel's wings, and brought back without a drop of water having touched me. When the people saw me thus, in safety and glory, not even having been immersed, they spread it abroad, and many were converted to the faith of Christ. The tyrant, in furious despair, shouted that it was all done by magic, and more obstinate than Pharaoh, ordered me to be dragged through the whole of Rome, and then shot at with arrows. When he saw me pierced with these shafts, swooning and dying, he cruelly had me thrown again into prison, so that I might die forsaken, and without any comfort. In the morning, expecting to find me dead, he was stupefied to find me rosy and well, singing psalms in praise of God. For in the night the Omnipotent One had given me a sweet sleep and my body had been anointed by an angel with a fragrant ointment, so that he found me healed and more beautiful than before. This caused the emperor to be in such cruel fury that he ordered me to be stripped once more and shot through with arrows until I was dead. But by the will of the Most High, the archers bent their bows, but the arrows would not move, and the tyrant cursed me for a witch. Hoping that witchcraft would be unavailing against fire, he ordered that arrows should be heated red-hot in a furnace, but my spouse saved me from this torment. Hardly had I been bound when I was wrapped in ecstasy, and the arrows speeding toward my body turned back against the archers, and six of them died pierced by them. At the sight of this new miracle, many more were converted, and the people began to turn in favor of the faith. Fearing more serious consequences, the tyrant ordered me to be beheaded without more ado. And so my soul fled all triumphant and glorious to heaven, to receive from my spouse the crown of virginity which had cost me so much, and which remained with so many palms of victory, sufficient ornament in which to appear before him. This happened on the tenth day of August, which was a Friday, at the hour which the Italians call nineteen and a half, which is half past three in the afternoon. Therefore, as I have told you, the Most High caused my translation to Magnano to take place on this day with so many signs of heavenly assistance that the glory of it might be shown forth. End quote. Now, the three miraculous revelations identical to this one paved a sure path to St. Philomena's addition to the canon of the saints. But let me back up a bit. The story of St. Philomena's relics themselves takes us on another journey of miracles and wonders. Upon opening the tomb in 1802, the relics of a young girl martyr were found and identified as such, along with a glass vase containing a portion of her blood in dried form. One of the first miracles encountered concerns this vial of blood that is reported to have taken on the appearance of sparkling gems shortly after its discovery. After being exhumed, the relics of St. Philomena were removed from the tomb and stored anonymously, basically in a cupboard in Rome, until 1805, when Canon Francis de Lucia from Mugnano, Italy, 
a small town near Naples, came to Rome seeking the relics of a martyred saint to bring home with him. And he, of course, found St. Philomena, or rather, perhaps she found him. As he perused the great hall of the treasury of relics in the Vatican, accompanied by his friend, the Bishop of Potenza, he paused before the relics of our saint, and his heart filled with a brilliant spiritual joy. He at once begged for the gift of these relics, and thought he had been successful in obtaining them. But as it turns out, a mistake had been made, and he returned home with the relics of a saint, yes, but the wrong saint. Now, remember St. Philomena told Sister Maria that God had interceded for her in order for her relics to arrive in Manana on her feast day. This is just the first of the holdups. So reluctantly, the young canon accepted the relics, but he couldn't forget about St. Philomena. When, after returning home to Manana, the canon became ill, he naturally prayed to St. Philomena and was instantly cured. This magnified his resolve to obtain her relics, and after some difficulties and much prayer, he finally managed his way through all the bureaucracy and prepared to bring the relics home. Together with another clerical friend, he secured a carriage for the journey, and finding no safer or convenient place to carry the box containing St. Philomena's relics, he stowed it in the recess beneath one of the seats of the carriage. The story goes that Canon Francis and his friend suffered a terrible journey, with constant jarring and a strange mysterious knocking sound that they could not identify. It was not until they were physically thrown from the carriage and the box containing the relics miraculously slid out from its tight place beneath the seat that it occurred to the two that St. Philomena had taken exception to being packed so unceremoniously beneath them. A holy martyr that very moment, and through all eternity enjoying the splendor of the face of God, deserved better honor. And so they immediately provided, allowing for one of them to sit outside the coach, while the box containing the relics rested on the cushion of one of the inside seats. This is the first known occasion of St. Philomena's famous knocking messages. Realizing more than ever the importance of reverence in the display of the holy relics, the canon and his companion stopped in Naples, where he had a statue of the saint and a casket made to encase the relics. Notably, while they were there, the mistress of the house in which they stayed was miraculously cured of a disease from which she had suffered for twelve years. The relics arrived in Mugnano on the 10th of August, 1805, figure that, followed by a trail of miracles. But the most influential of these was the cure of Pauline Jericho, called the Great Miracle of Mugnano. Founder of the Society of the Propagation of the Faith and the Foundation of the Living Rosary, young Pauline was well known to Pope Gregory XVI, so that when her already fragile health failed entirely and she announced to him her intention to make a pilgrimage to Mugnano to seek a miracle from St. Philomena, the Pope did not expect to see her alive again, and remarked that if indeed she were cured, he could attest personally to its being a first-class miracle. She in turn exacted his promise that he would start the process of beatification for St. Philomena if she returned to him cured, and he agreed, but with no expectations. So off went Pauline, with high hopes herself. If anyone could intercede for her with God, it would be her little friend St. Philomena. So, paralyzed and nearly dying, Pauline Jericho arrived at the sanctuary of St. Philomena in Mugnano on August 8, 1835, carried upon an invalid's chair. Some witnesses report that she looked already like a cadaver, barely hanging on to life. For two days, however, she prayed before the relics of St. Philomena and on August 10th, during the blessing with the Most Holy Sacrament, she felt instantly cured, got up, and to the wonder of all, walked without support. Here's the story in her own words, beginning with a description of her illness. Quote, For many years I had been affected by various illnesses, so serious that I had no hope of healing as established by a consultation of the doctors of Lyon, who asserted that the resurrection of the dead would have been a miracle of the Most High, and my health for the incurable illnesses required more miracles, and big ones. 
But what scared me most of all and made me tremble every moment with the possibility of imminent death was an aneurysm of the heart with which I had suffered for many years, and that especially for the past fifteen months caused me deadly heart palpitations that took my breath away and forced me to stay nearly always in bed. The doctors considered my life like a daily prodigy because the blood that palpitated in my heart would strike back in my chest where a sore had generated, which would constantly make me sick with rotten blood, which gave off an intolerable smell even for myself, and I had developed an enormous obstruction in my liver that caused an enormous swelling of my whole body, from the soles of my feet to my neck, as everybody could see. Now, with the medals of the Most Holy Virgin Mary and of St. Philomena, which we had placed inside and out in many places of the coach, and provided even our carriage attendants with, it felt as if we had called the angels of the Lord around us for our protection. Our journey by day and night, never interrupted, was completely exempt from the slightest incident. By simple accidental circumstances, which I like to attribute to my lovable protector Philomena, I arrived in Mugnano at the same time that the blessing of the Holy Sacrament was taking place, after the end of the most solemn Vespers for my dear advocate's important festivity, and this was, for me, a sign for a happy and saintly wish. My ardent intention to come to the glorious tomb of St. Philomena to pay her homage was not to ask for my healing, since I thought that I'd be better to entrust myself into the hands of God, who knows best what is most advantageous. But the charity of the good people who were in the church, and of the good foreign devotees of the saint, who were numerous inside and outside, who were present at my arrival, thought that the intention of my journey was the return of my health. I therefore heard a general shouting which made me understand that all those souls moved to pity for me were asking the thaumaturge for my healing. From the night of Saturday the 8th of August until Monday the 10th, I was brought to the church twice a day on my chair with armrests, and the people who were at the feet of the saint were asking with fervor for my healing. At last, Monday evening, at the moment of the blessing of the Most Holy Sacrament, I felt an unusual strength in me, and with ease I wanted to kneel down. I felt the urge to try and walk, and to go out of the church without my chair. I had it brought after me for precaution, in case my weakness would return. But to my amazement, I managed, without it or any other support, to walk up to my hotel, and more remarkably, I managed to climb freely a whole steep flight of stairs, which I had not managed for the last fifteen months. From this moment, I managed without any help to go from my accommodation to the church, walk across Magnano, and even accompany the Most Holy Viaticum in difficult places, and this without feeling the terrible aches typical of my illness. Furthermore, I have been comfortable kneeling down like all the other faithful during the sacred functions, and I can say without any exaggeration that my health is improving more and more. This is glorifying for her through our Lord Jesus Christ and the Queen of Virgins. Honor this lovable girl in whom the power of the divine triumph has so visibly showed itself. O Philomena, preferred daughter and charity of Our Lady of Graces, your heavenly mother delights herself in the beauty of your merits. She glorifies herself in all the surprising features of your virtues for her son's honor, your spouse, and her heart rejoices at the sight of the palms and crowns which all the people of earth decree to you with much honor. O Philomena, your charity has made you admirable, known by all the nations. Your name has come to give my unhappy country a great reason for hope. This so sweet and powerful name has reached as far as me, and as soon as I heard it I was attracted to your celebrated tomb, and I have tested the effects of your generous charity. I need to say to your glory that the benefits already received by me with your intercession are much higher than the ones of my body of which I have already reported in detail. Therefore I believe that this recognition imposed on me to consecrate myself to my illustrious benefactress. Yes, Philomena, all my life I want to love you like my beloved, honor you like my protecting angel, and I hope, with the divine help, to contribute as much as I can to your honor, so that everybody can experience, like me, how much you are generously good toward those that tenderly love you and invoke you. 
I have written down all these details to inform everybody of the unhappy state of my health prior to the prodigious grace of my health. Details that I have signed and written with my own hand and with people as witness, to give homage to the truth and fulfill the debt, although ineffectively, of my due recognition, and to reply to the request made by the ecclesiastic and civil authority of Mugnano. End quote. When Pauline returned to Rome, the Pope requested she remain for a year to officially verify her miraculous healing so that he could deliver his promise. And so, her cure proven complete, he did. In 1837, Pope Gregory XVI solemnly confirmed the public veneration of St. Philomena and bestowed a Mass in her honor. A saint of miracles, St. Philomena became a saint through miracles. She is the only person recognized as a saint solely on the basis of miraculous intercession. No historic proof of her martyrdom exists except her name and the evidence of her martyrdom carved on her tomb. But her devotees have no doubt of her existence. Her multitude of miracles, beginning at the discovery of her tomb in 1802, have multiplied exponentially the more she has become known, in spite of all effort to suppress her veneration. Pope Leo XII granted permission for the erection of altars and churches in her honor. Pope Gregory XVI authorized her public veneration and named her patroness of the living rosary. The cure of Pope Pius IX, while still Archbishop of Imola, was attributed to St. Philomena, and in 1849 he subsequently named her patroness of the children of Mary. Pope Leo XIII approved the confraternity of St. Philomena and raised it to an archconfraternity. Pope St. Pius X raised the archconfraternity to a universal archconfraternity and named St. John Vianney its patron. St. John Vianney himself called St. Philomena the new light of the church militant and had a strong and well-known devotion to her. Others with known devotion to St. Philomena include St. Anthony Mary Claret, St. Euphrasia Pelletier, St. Francis Xavier Cabrini, St. John Nepomucci Newman, St. Madeline Sophie Barat, St. Peter Chanel, Blessed Peter Julian Amard, St. Damien of Molokai, Blessed Anna Maria Taigi, and of course, the Venerable Pauline Jericho. Though the Novus Ordo has tried to expunge St. Philomena from the hearts and minds of the faithful by ostensibly removing her from the calendar of the saints in 1961, St. Philomena refuses to be buried again. Her miraculous intercessions occur daily throughout the world, over 1,700 years after her death and more than 200 years after her name became known again to the world. Friends of St. Philomena know for a fact that she is who she says she is and that she is indeed our Thaumaturge, or the Wonder Worker, that St. Gregory XVI proclaimed her. She is the patroness of hopeless cases, expectant mothers, and young people and has been adopted as one of the special patronesses of those who remain faithful to the true church in these troubled and confusing times. As one Catholic writer puts it, It does seem that God reserved St. Philomena as a remedy for our corrupt times. She has been sent to guide us away from the darkness of naturalism and materialism to the supernatural light of the fire of divine love which she enkindles within souls. Further, through the power of her intercession, which is so great that she could be considered the patron saint of everything, she gives hope and faith in God to souls surrounded by the despair of atheism and a world descending into barbarism. No wonder this great light, like Our Lady of Fatima, had to be suppressed by the forces of organized naturalism that finally gained control over the Church in the 1960s. St. Philomena, in her victory over temptation and of her martyrdom, is an especially powerful beacon of hope for us in our own struggles because of her very littleness. As a young girl who was barely a teenager, it is all the clearer to us that to endure her martyrdom, she could not rely on her own strength, but needed constant recourse to God. In reality, this is how every human being must conquer temptation, but because of our lack of humility, we must be reminded of our need to constantly pray for help.
We need this encouragement not only in our ordinary struggles, but for our more difficult trials, even for a, quote, white martyrdom or bloody martyrdom. God desires that we fix our eyes upon him alone and upon eternity, as St. Philomena did, because it is in this way that we too will emerge from this life victorious. End quote. Upon raising the Archconfraternity of St. Philomena to the status of universal Archconfraternity, Pope St. Pius X, in the apostolic brief Pias Fidelium Societate, solemnly stated, quote, To discredit the present decisions and declarations concerning St. Philomena as not being permanent, stable, valid, and effective, necessary of obedience, and in full effect for all eternity, proceeds from an element that is null and void and without merit or authority. End quote. So, in case anyone has any doubt at all about the legitimacy of our Saint Philomena, you might say that the last Pope declared a saint has the last word. Now, See what I mean about the story of St. Philomena, compared to all the other characters and all the other stories you've ever heard. Truth is greater than fiction. This spunky, determined, and exceptionally discerning and wise young woman is a superhero worthy of our admiration and imitation, and a friend well worth having. St. Philomena, powerful with God, pray for us.